All right, so we're talking about frames that are translating and rotating, but let, let's stick with the rotating. And like I said, first, some vector manipulations, because doing vector manipulations in 3D is going to be pretty important here. So this is vector manipulations. And hopefully this is a review. Although there may be a new twist when we get to cross products. Let's just use a, a common frame and I'll call this you know, the E frame. So E1, E2, E3 are unit vectors. And I've got two vectors, A and B. So here's A vector, here's the B vector. All right, and we would write them both, if we were to write them in the E frame, then we'd write the components, you know, A1, E1, A2 is in the E2 direction and A3, in the E3 direction. And same for um, B, B1 in the E1 direction. B2 is the second component and then B3 is the third component. And, you know, as we've written, Already, we could also write this in column form. All right. So we've just established we have A vectors and B vectors. Okay. So what might we want to do? Well, the dot product of two vectors is going to be important. We'll be using that. Uh, so A dot B. And you can write it two different ways. And it kind of depends on the context, which one is the better one to use. But you could write A dot B as A, that's the magnitude of the A vector times B, the magnitude of the B vector, and then cosine of the angle between these two. So let's call that angle theta. And I've got a is equal to the magnitude of A, the vector, and B is equal to the magnitude of the B vector. So A dot B, we could also write it in terms of components, right? Which would be A1 times B1 plus A2 times B2 plus A3 times B3. So, both of these are legitimate ways to work out and write the dot product, okay? Now, what about the cross product? Cross products are more interesting, also somewhat mysterious, right? So the cross product, A cross B, um, one of my favorite ways, would be okay let's let's write it as it's magnitude of a times magnitude of b then the sine of the angle between them so sine theta times uh i'll write this as u hat what is u hat u hat is the unit vector it's a it's a unit vector in the direction of the A cross B, given by the right-hand rule. Okay. So, whoa, I didn't mean to do that. So that is one way. Um, and if we were to draw, where is, uh, how do I draw A? Must be. Uh, there's, there's, that's the u hat unit vector. I'm imagining theta is kind of small, a cross b. Okay. Another way that you could write this is component by component. Right. That's the more. That's the trickier one. But it will be important, um, mostly because of the angular velocity. When we do things with angular velocity cross a vector, you're going to have to do the cross product. So you've probably seen this thing with the like determinant type way of writing it. 
and I, I I'm, I'm not a big fan of this. So I'll give you another. I can't remember how to do this. I think it's like uh, the E1 component and then you do cross product something, usual determinants. It's, I think it's more memorization than necessary. So there's another way. Uh, maybe E3, B2 plus the E2 component. That one's probably the hardest. And then plus, we'll do the E3 component, which is um, A1, B2 minus A2, B1. Okay. Um, yeah, I, I don't like this way. So there's another way and this is also going to be necessary for the book because it, it, it uses the, this approach. But from, uh, from the vector A, and we'll say, you know, the vector A written in E components, which we've already written up above, but I'll just repeat it here A1, A2, A3. We construct a skew symmetric. Like, uh oh, this doesn't sound good. A skew symmetric three by three matrix. You might be thinking, wait, it, that sounds way simpler. It will be eventually. So, A, and then you put a little tilde on it. It's fun to say, tilde. And then you put a little box around it. But uh, the main thing is remembering the entries of this three by three matrix. To be skew symmetric, it has to have zeros along the diagonal. And then this is negative A3, A2, negative A1. And because it skews symmetric, that means the other side of the diagonal is the same thing, but with negative signs. So this would be A3, negative A2, A1. Okay, L let me just double check that that's right, because that's, that's important, I think. Yeah, it's about right. So once you've defined this matrix, then A cross B is actually A tilde as a three by three matrix times uh, B as a column matrix. And you might be saying at first, this is not better, but it is. Okay, so we've got that times B1, B2, B3. I, I think it's easier to remember how to do a matrix multiplication. That's why. So if you memorize this A tilde thing, then now as you do matrix multiplication, you will get the same thing we have up here. Okay, so this will be um, A2. B3 minus A3, B2, A3, B1 minus A1, B3, A1, B2 minus A2, B1. And I'll leave it to you to do that matrix multiplication. Now, the, the key thing is the A and B matrix, uh, the A and B vectors were written with respect to the same frame, the same E frame basis. So this is also going to be in the E frame. So these are E frame components. Okay. And uh, we usually don't tell you this till you get to the junior year because it is a secret. All right. So with that in hand, hopefully this will make life a little bit easier at some point. It definitely gets used by the book. So um, remember this. It's, um, it's kind of cool. There's a lot of weird math behind it uh, that we can't honestly get into, but it works, okay? 
So now with that review of some vector manipulations behind us, we can uh, review the transport theorem. That's not it. Is this it? Like, what are you looking at? I'm, I have to, I have like this giant screen. I have to uh, deal with the screen, two screens, four screens. There's actually four screens in front of me. It's like being a fighter pilot or something. You go crazy with too much digital input. All right, so um, just to repeat what the transport theorem was, because it's going to be important. And then we'll we'll do examples with the transport theorem. Okay. Do some examples. Remember the transport theorem was the main thing was if you were um, if you want to look at motion. In it's usually we, we think of the inertial frame. Here's N1, N2, N3. And we use N for inertial because it's where Newton's laws apply typically. I mean, we typically use N is always the frame. Inertial frames are where Newton's laws apply. All right, and then if we have a a B frame, and I'll just try to draw some kind of kooky looking rotated frame. And for now, we're thinking of they share the same origin. Okay, so we've got the uh, the B frame rotates with respect to the N frame with um, an instantaneous angular velocity vector. I got to pick a color for this thing, choose green. Uh, omega B with respect to N and it's something, some vector. And we're trying to Look at the, um, uh, for instance, the motion of a point P. So <clears throat> R is this vector from O to P. So we might write things that way. O, point O, point P with a line over it. Okay. And the velocity of P as seen in the B frame, we might say with respect to the B frame is what we would will write as the time derivative of R, but then the superscript B. So this is the velocity of P seen by the B frame, by an observer in the B frame. And I'll show you a couple of videos for that. Uh, the velocity, you know, to do, to end up doing Newton's laws, we're going to have to do F equals MA, where that A is the acceleration with respect to an inertial frame, not acceleration with respect to a rotating frame, but everything starts with the first getting the velocity. So the velocity of P as seen in the N frame is time derivative of R, but then we put that superscript N there. And then the way that these two are related is the transport theorem. So they are related by a, the transport theorem. The transport theorem is sometimes called, um, I think even the book calls it this, the vector differentiation formula, but Nobody else is going to call it that. More people will know it as the transport theorem. And what's that relationship? It's that the time derivative or the velocity of P as seen by the N frame, the inertial frame, will be the velocity 
as seen by the B-frame, plus an extra part that's due to the rotation of the B-frame with respect to the end frame. Okay. So that's 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 important. Mm. Just to say it again, this is motion relative to the end frame. This is motion relative to the B frame. And then this other term would be motion of B frame. Motion due to rotation of B frame relative to end frame. So one way to interpret this, um, we'll start with a simple situation, which is a straight line motion in the inertial frame. So imagine a cannon shooting a cannonball straight. If a cannon, um, so let's say straight line motion in the uh, end frame. So if I've got something starting here and then I, the cannon shoots and it's shooting um, in this, you know, this direction, I would see straight line motion. So this is a scene in the end frame. But now let's imagine I've got a turntable. You guys know about vinyl records? I used to talk about turntables. I got two turntables and a microphone. Um, I have some records, but I have nothing to play them on. If only I had a turntable or phonograph. Phonograph makes it sound super ancient, which I guess it is. So if I have a B frame, that's now going to be, I've got some kind of disc. And this, I'm looking at the motion with respect to a steadily rotating turntable. So the turntable rotates with some angular velocity omega that is steady, meaning it's not changing in time. So that means omega is constant. Um, then I've got some omega B with respect to N. So for me, Viewing this in the uh, end frame, this looks like a straight line, but what if I have, what if I now stand on the turntable and look at how things are moving? If I stand on the turntable, so that means I'll draw up here, what's the motion of this straight line as seen in the B frame, the firing of the cannon. Uh, here is my turntable. In the turntable, it's going to look like the path of this is curved. Okay, so here what I've drawn is the velocity as seen by the end frame uh, or motion seen by the end frame. This is motion seen by the B frame. It's going to look curved. Okay, so rotating versus non-rotating. Let me show you a couple videos. This is a cannon on the turntable that'll be regularly shooting cannons. So of course, in the inertial frame, they're going straight. But then once we jump into that, the turntable's frame, you will see that they are rotating. In fact, they're, they're turning to the right. So that, that's one example. Another example would be um, if I had a pendulum that's just sort of going back and forth. In the inertial frame, it'll look like it's just sort of oscillating back and forth on a straight line path. But what does that same motion look like in a rotating frame? Um, so pendulum viewed from a turntable is what I'll show next. 
So we've got the, this, this video will show that there's a string uh, high above with the pendulum bob. And so the pendulum is just moving back and forth in a straight line. But, and this might get you dizzy, it gets me dizzy. If you view this in a rotating frame, the motion of the pendulum, it seems to be following this path that in fact curves back on itself. So this is why viewing motion that's familiar to us in a rotating frame sometimes becomes unfamiliar. But uh, in spacecraft dynamics, there's, there's, there could be many different rotating frames. Wow, that kind of sped up and got weird. Anyway, let's stop this. Stop, stop, okay. You could also have, uh, imagine instead of a turntable, I've got a shallow bowl and I put a ball and let it, I release it from rest. It should just kind of go back and forth in the bowl, but in the rotating frame, it'll look like something else is going on. So I, I have a, a video of, of that. This is not very good video, but on the left, that's the inertial frame. And then there's a camera high above that's rotating. So we're just sort of seeing what the motion looks like due to a rotating frame on the, in the right. So this is the ball. There's a ball in a, a bowl. So on the left, you can just see it's just going back and forth, much like what the pendulum does in oscillatory motion. But on the right, you see this curved path as seen by the, the camera that's rotating. So that's just to give you some familiarity with, okay, I get it. Motion seen in a rotating frame will be different and things are related by this. But as I, as I said before, so I'll repeat it here, this transport theorem works not just for the position vector, it works for all vectors. And it works not just for uh, one of the frames being the inertial frame, it works for any two frames. So any two frames that are related by a angular velocity will have this relationship for their, um, the velocity seen by each frame. It's probably worth trying this. Let's, let's do a, an example calculation. And we'll do this turntable example, may as well. So we'll, we'll really use the transport theorem. Let me draw my turntable again. It's, it's roundish. Okay, here is the, the middle of the turntable. I'll use that as the origin. And there is a, there's a frame attached to the turntable. I'll call that the B frame. And I'll use B1, B2. So those are in the turntable. This is a turntable. And let's say it's rotating. Uh, with an angular velocity omega. There's also an inertially fixed frame. I'll use N1 and N2 to represent that. So the turntable rotates with respect to the uh, end frame. The turntable, and I guess we could say to which the B frame is attached, rotates with respect to the end frame with an angular velocity, a scalar angular velocity, omega. But to event to use the transport theorem, we need to find out what is the angular velocity vector. I'm imagining just a, 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 a turntable be a, a disk that's just rotating. So in the direction that it's rotating, use your right hand and get your fingers moving in that direction. Your thumb points in the axis of rotation direction. So the angular 
velocity vector is omega b with respect to the end frame. Omega, and then that direction coming out of the screen is, you could either call it n3 or b3. Um, it's omega n3, but n3 direction equals the b3 direction. So the, the z direction is the same. So that's that, okay. Um, maybe we'll just make a note here, I've put a, it's coming out of the screen, N3 direction, which is also the same as the B3 direction. Okay. And I will have, I'll pretend that, uh, here's a, this is my stick figure person, right? Standing on the turntable. And there's also this other stick figure red person that's at rest with respect to the inertial frame. Okay. And uh, imagine I'm trying to track something that's moving on the turntable. Last time I talked about bugs crawling on the sphere. How about this is, I don't know, a cat that's moving. So the point P is like the motion of a cat on the turntable. Um, I can write the vector from O to P. So here's R. But um, typically I want to write this in terms of the uh, components with respect to some frame. So I'm going to choose that I'll, I'm going to write Cartesian components, but with respect to the B frame. So I've got X and I've got Y. So R written in B frame components, X B1 plus Y B2. Okay. Hopefully that's clear. Um, so that's, that's the position seen by the rotating B frame. And now I'm going to uh, just take the time derivative of R with respect to the B frame. And you might wonder, well, what do I do when I have a scalar times a vector? Well, we could use the product rule. So this would be the time derivative with respect to the B frame of X times B1 plus the time um, plus X times the time derivative of the B1 direction with respect to the B frame plus the same thing for uh, Y. And I'm running out of room here. Y times. Uh, time derivative of the B2 direction with respect to the B frame. Since the B frame, here's my blue frame representing the B frame. Since my, these blue directions are attached to the turntable, they don't move with respect to the turntable. The B frame unit vectors do not change with respect to the B frame. So, this is zero and this is zero. And we'll come up with some shorthand for this. The time rate of change of a scalar, any scalar, including that component X with respect to the B frame, you don't, you don't really need, it doesn't matter about the B frame. So this is the same as D by DT of X. And just for shorthand, we're gonna call that X dot, okay? Time rate of change of X. Same for this up here. This is gonna be time rate of change of Y or Y dot. So this equals just X dot B1 plus Y dot B2. If this person standing on the turntable were to see and you know measure the velocity, measure how X is changing with time and how Y is changing with time, this is what they would measure. Okay. 
Now, the second ingredient to find, if, if I wanna know what is this person measuring, the red inertially fixed person, they want, they will measure, if they were to measure the velocity, they're going to get time rate of change of R with respect to the end frame. And that will be related to this by the transport theorem. And the other ingredient to that transport theorem, right, was this omega cross R term. So let's work out what omega cross R is. I've got omega, let me give myself a little bit more room. Omega cross R equals what? It equals, so we could we could do that fancy thing I, I mentioned before, but because omega is just has one component, the B3 component, maybe we could do this a simpler way. So we'll just write this out. Omega B3 cross X B1 plus Y B2. Okay, let's distribute this. So we'll get omega times x, and that's in the direction of B3 cross B1 plus omega times y in the direction B3 cross B2. Okay. So now we just have to work out what, it, and we'll use the right-hand rule. What is B3, so if this is my frame, if you look at the screen, this is, this would be B3 up here. This is B1, so B3 cross B1, my thumb is pointing in the B2 direction. Okay, so this would be B2. Let's do the same thing for the other cross product. B3 cross B2, my thumb is pointing in the negative B1 direction. So this is negative B1. So this is omega X B2 minus omega y b1. Okay, cool. And now from the transport theorem, we, we add this to this, and that gives us this. All right, so just let's just add those two up. Time rate of change of the r vector this plus this. And now write it all out. X dot B1 plus Y dot B2 plus Omega X B2 minus Omega Y B1. And let's collect terms so that we've got all the B1 components together and all the B2 component together. And what we will get is, we'll get X dot minus omega Y in the B1 direction plus Y dot plus omega X in the B2 direction. So that's the, that's what the velocity would look like as measured by uh, the inertially fixed person. And now you might be thinking, hold on, you're writing the inertial velocity of the point P, but you're writing it in terms of rotating frame components. Yeah, I can do that. If, if that bothers you and you wanna relate the B frame uh, components to the end frame, then you could do what we did last time where this would be related by, uh, all right, you noticed I didn't mention anything about what's the angle of rotation, but if you really wanted to work that out, then there's our angle theta 
and you could figure out if you wanted to how is you know n1 n2 related to b1 and b2 by that rotation matrix but you might not have to you might not have to all right um okay this is very much related to your uh, kind of ungraded, not turned in, just for fun, homework zero, uh, problem two. So I would say, you know, try homework zero, problem two. Homework zero, problem two is a polar coordinate frame, but it's in the same spirit. A polar coordinate frame is like a rotating frame where B1, the B1 direction is always pointing towards your particle and you use theta and r. Here we did, we used, we made up these Cartesian components as measured by us on the turntable and then said, okay, let's go with those as our coordinates, which is perfectly legitimate. All right. So that's one use of the transport theorem. Um, we could look at, Another example. So let's look at the example of a transport theorem for the rotating Earth. So this was simpler because we were imagining the Earth is flat. I don't think it's flat. There's an interesting Netflix documentary, though, about people who think the Earth is flat. But let's look at the uh, rotating spherical Earth. So this is another example. Um, a fixed point, meaning it's not moving on the rotating Earth. And this is, uh, I have to reach, kind of see things. Okay, this is, I think it's example 1.4 book. Yeah, okay. So this is example 1.4 of, I'll just say S and J, Schaub and Junkins. Okay. Let me conjure up an image that is definitely complicated looking. Oh my goodness. But we won't fret. Okay. So we're looking at a um, let's just imagine this is us. This is the location of us on the rotating Earth. Uh, so the Earth, we're at this, uh, this angle phi would be our, I sometimes get latitude and longitude mixed up. I think it's called uh, latitude. Yeah, so what are we at, like 35 degrees lat north latitude or something? So phi is the latitude angle. And you might be wondering, well, why isn't the longitude playing any role? It, we're just gonna ask the question, what is the inertial uh, velocity of this point P? Which just, let's say where, where, where we are. So that's the question we're asking. What is the inertial velocity of a fixed point P at latitude P. And so it says, well, what do you mean by inertial velocity? Which frame are you using? Um, if you want to think of something, think of the Earth-centered inertial frame. Okay, so the Earth-centered inertial frame centered at the center of the earth. So here's our origin O. And uh, I like drawing inertial directions in red. So here's the, the inertial directions N1, N2, N3. So the inertial frame uh, centered 
at the center of the Earth. We'll call that the end frame. And if I use the fancy kind of script end, the book does. So it's got origin O and then these directions where uh, N1, N2 is in the equatorial plane. And the N3 direction is the North Pole. So the Earth is, is rotating about that um, direction. So we've defined an N frame. I don't, I'm, I'm not gonna get you used to the fancy N. So there, that's the N frame. There's also an E frame, which is fixed in the Earth. Okay, it's an Earth fixed frame. And we could use some other colors, I guess, for that. Blue, E1, E2, and then E3 is the same. So E frame is uh, fixed on the rotating Earth. So that, that's the frame with which, respect to which I am not moving right now. And presumably you are not moving. So we will use the same origin, but then we've got E1, E2, which are also in the equatorial plane. And then E3 is the same. It's the polar direction. So E3 equals N3. And we're gonna have to use the transport theorem at some point. So we need to know how is the earth rotating or basically how is the E frame, this earth fixed frame rotating with respect to the end frame. <clears throat> and so this angle phi sub G sub G is the, the angle between the two frames. And notice how it's defined. It points from the N1 direction to the E1 direction. So that means phi G dot. So the time rate of change of that is the angular velocity not vector yet, but the angular velocity rate of the Earth, Earth's rotation. Okay. Um, and maybe I'll, I'll write it up here in the upper left-hand corner. So omega of the E frame with respect to the N frame is omega G dot. It's that rotation rate times the axis of rotation which we can write as either E3 or N3. North pole unit vector. Okay. Now, what is omega G dot? It's worth thinking about. The book actually gets it wrong. Um, sorry, book. But omega G dot, uh, well, first of all, let's think about We're talking about the Earth, the Earth's rotation with respect to an inertial frame. So um, you might be thinking that um, the Earth rotates once every 24 hours, but that's not true, right? That just means this is the road, that's the rotation of the Earth with respect to uh, the sun, but of course, so 24 hours is the time from like noon to noon, but um, with respect to an inertially fixed direction, it's actually slightly less than 24 hours. So this is the difference of what's called a sidereal period and a synodic period. The synodic period of the earth is the time from noon to noon. So when the sun is in the same direction in the sky. So we could say the synodic period of Earth. 
I, I, I mean, like it's super close to 24 hours. But what we're talking about is the sidereal period. So just to remind, so what do I mean by synodic? So this is with respect to sun. The sidereal period of earth is slightly less. And this is um, with respect to the fixed stars. So when the earth rotates, it comes back to the same position every something smaller than this. It's, it's gonna be about one minus one divided by 365, number of days in a year times 24 hours, which is about, I don't know, 23.93 hours, something close to that. And so that's what we mean here by the rotation of the earth. It's the sidereal period. So we need to get the sidereal rate. So gamma, I don't know why I'm writing sub G. I'm, that's just what the book's got. Gamma sub G dot would be, we'll write this in terms of degrees. So the earth rotates 360 degrees every 23.93 hours. And you could work out what that is. Um, often in this class, we're gonna want to express things in terms of radians per second. So if you know how many seconds is in an hour, 3,600, and you know how many radians is in a degree, then you could work this out. And it's got, uh, it's, it's something very, very small. 729, there we go. So 0. 0.0000. 729 radians per second. Totally different than what the book has. I, I don't know what the book's thinking. Anyway, so that's the rate of rotation in terms of radians per second. All right. And um, you're going to need to use radians per second to get the eventual expression because we want, you know, if I want to know, you know, what is my inertial velocity, I'm going to want something like meters per second. Um, so even though it might be convenient for you to think in terms of degrees for some things, when you're writing these angular velocity rates, radians per second. So I'll just put a note here. you will typically need to express angular velocities in radians per second in order to get things correct. All right. Um, okay, so now, we, we'll, now we'll use the transport theorem. We've got, we've got, we've written up here what the angular velocity vector of the rotating earth is we're at this point p so here's the vector r r points from the center of the earth to us on the surface so r is o to p um, which is it's a distance i think before i wrote this as r Earth. So it's the radius of the Earth times that direction. It's kind. Of, it's like a, a spherical coordinate vector, but here we've written it as u for up. E points in the east, and n points north. So this uh, frame E N U is sometimes called the topographic frame but really it's just a spherical coordinate frame. So this is, it's that amount R in this U direction up at our latitude. So we could work out using trig, you know, what is the up direction if we wanted to. Um, I don't know if we want to just yet. <clears throat> our velocity, 
with respect to the earth is the zero vector. I'm not moving with respect to the rotating earth. But if I want to get my inertial velocity, so it would be zero. So I'll just skip writing the zero. Angular velocity cross r. OK, so that angular velocity cross r is what? Um, this is radius of the Earth, omega g, sorry, not omega. If I've been saying omega, I meant gamma. Gamma g dot um, times e3 cross u. So we've got a cross product of two unit vectors. So we could either map this, uh, the North Pole direction into our local frame or map our local up direction into some inertial directions. Okay, I think it's easier to do that. Um, well, you know, we could use both. So what, what did we figure out from before? E3 cross EU would be the magnitude of E3 cross the magnitude of u times the, uh, I forget what it was. Was it sine or cosine of the angle between them? I'm gonna have to sneak up here. I forget these things. Sine, okay, great, super. Oops, so where, where what angle are we talking? We're talking about this angle. Let's call that theta. Okay, notice that theta plus phi is 90 degrees. Okay. So this would be times sine of theta. But of course, these are each unit vectors. So that's one and that's one. Um, and then we need to have what that direction is. What is E3 cross U? E3 cross U, it's the E direction, east. That makes sense. Okay, so E, this is the direction of E3 cross U. Okay, sine, it's because theta plus phi is 90 degrees or let's see, pi over two, however you wanna think of it. So sine of theta equals sine of 90 degrees minus V. And hopefully you know the trig identity that that is cosine of V. Okay. So that means we've got radius of the earth, rotation rate of the earth, cosine V, E. E is the eastward, the local eastward direction. So that would be it. Um, we'll sometimes write as shorthand for the inertial derivative, inertial rate of change, we'll write you know, r dot. So r dot is this. And depending on our, uh, depending on our latitude, it will be like, you could work out what the value is. We're moving pretty fast with respect to an inertial frame. And we even know the direction now. So if we were to go sneak up back here, what's our velocity? Our velocity is in this direction. And we know it's magnitude. It's, the magnitude is that. Okay, so we've done, done that example. Uh, you can see, you see how the book does it differently if you want in example 1.4. I wanted to mention that sometimes you'll be dealing with frames that are not just rotating, but also translating.
So we can consider frames that are translating, which means they're moving. Moving frames would be normal, normal way you'd explain it to people. Um, so a moving frame. All right. Translating and rotating. Where might this come into play? Well, if I'm, here's some kind of an inertial frame and here's a, there's a spacecraft with a body fixed frame. So there's a B frame, here's an N frame. And maybe I'm trying, my, my satellite, I'm trying to catch up with something or maybe I'm trying to avoid something like a piece of debris that's becoming more and more of a problem. So how do I describe, let's say, you know, the B frame, this B frame is moving, it's translating and rotating with respect to an inertially fixed frame. And I wanna track how this point P is moving. So that's just sort of a thumbnail sketch. Um, now let's, now I'll be more careful about writing the sketch so if we have a point P, um, and this is in, if you want to follow along in the book. So section 1.3.4. But I'm gonna follow it slightly differently. They've got sort of like, look like two asteroids. Uh, I'll draw an inertial frame Here's my inertial frame, N1, N2, N3. And then I've got a, and the origin of that is O. And then I've got another frame. Which could be both rotating and translating. The origin of that is O prime. Okay. And then I'll write the, the location of the origin of the B frame with respect to my inertial frame is capital R. The location of the point P is little r with respect to O. And then the location. I'm trying to draw straight lines. Straight line, location of P with respect to this moving or translating and rotating frame is rho. Okay, so R equals O P. Rho equals O prime P. Capital R equals O to O prime. And if you look at how these are related, R is R plus rho. Little r equals big R plus rho, okay? Now, since the B frame could be translating, it means that uh, R could be a function of time. So B frame could be translating. So that means that the vector capital R could be a function of time. And we'll take that into account by saying the inertial derivative of capital R. So the, the derivative of R, capital R with respect to the end frame, we'll call that the velocity of O prime. This is the notation we'll use. So V, velocity of O prime with respect to the end frame. Now, what is the inertial velocity of P? So let's just kind of leave that over here. The inertial velocity of the point P would be given by 
we'll write it this way, inertial velocity of P. So that means velocity of P with respect to the end frame. We're using this other notation just because it, it helps. But what else do we know about this? This is the inertial derivative of R, little r. So we know that is the inertial derivative, substituting in what little r is, r is capital R plus rho, capital R plus rho. So let's write, this is inertial derivative of capital R plus inertial derivative of rho. That just follows from the fact that the derivative, this time rate of change acts separately on each of the vectors. It's, it's a linear operator. Um, and we've already said what this is from right here. This is the velocity of O prime, the point O prime as seen by the end frame. And now what about this, this thing? For that, we can use the, um, we need to use the transport theorem. So inertial derivative of rho is the derivative of rho as seen by the B frame, plus this part that's due to how the B frame rotates with respect to the N frame. So omega B slash N cross rho. Okay. So putting all of this together, we have a, a, a modified version of our transport theorem. <clears throat> Uh, oops, that's all but so. The inertial velocity of P with respect to N has this part that takes into account that the B frame could have a velocity. And then another part, we could put, we could write this part if we wanted to as the velocity of P as seen by the B frame. And then we'll just leave this cross product thing as it is. So velocity of the point P as seen by the B frame plus the part due to rotation. And maybe I'll just put my little notes as to what each of these mean, right? This is the um, velocity of P relative to the end frame. This is the velocity of origin of the B frame, or if you want, it's just the velocity of the B frame relative to the end frame. This is the velocity of P relative to the B frame. And this part takes into account how the B frame, so we call this the velocity contribution, contribution due to rotation of the B frame with respect to uh, the end frame. Okay. And if you're following along, this is equation 1.29. Uh, so we'll look at examples of using, using this new formula, um, for a 2D and 3D case of frames that are translating and rotating next time. If you have any additional questions or anything that haven't been asked or I didn't get to. Yeah, Professor, I just had a question. Yeah. Um, so when we were doing the, um, the earlier example of the earth uh, rotating. Um, I was a little confused why um, 
we only used part of the uh, transport theorem for that. Are we just saying because um, that, so like- So up right, right, right here? Yeah. Yeah, so here we would have had the derivative, how we're moving with respect to the rotating mm -hmm. frame, but that, but that was zero. Ah, okay. So I just, I just didn't put it in. Got you, because we were so thinking we were using the initial fixed uh, frame. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. All right, thank you. Yeah, no problem. Anybody else? Yeah. Could you scroll down? Yeah, and um, other than that, I've got I've got nothing else. So.